Now, since in our last video, we brought up Adam, Adam and Eve, we're going to go back there. And I don't mean to contradict what we did when we looked at them as symbols, but now I want to look at them as the literal interpretation as husband and wife, as man and woman married, coming together to create a family unit. One of the major purposes of the temple ends in that ceiling room. We don't end in the endowment room. We end in a ceiling room. That's the highest and holiest covenant that we make where we create a family. And I remind you in section two, the first recorded section, section one was given a year and a half later, and it's called his preface. The Lord deliberately put section one first as a preface. But the first chronological section of the Doctrine and Covenants is section two. And it clearly states that the Lord would send Elijah to bring those sealing keys. And then this declaration, that if Elijah doesn't come, the whole earth would be wasted at the Lord's coming. And I think we have permission to say that if Elijah doesn't come and bring sealing keys, if we can't seal families for eternity, then this whole earth was a waste. That is the culmination. We are here to create eternal families. And that is why everything points to the temple. And so much in the temple is pointing us to the culmination of that eternal family, how to create it, how to maintain it, what covenants we need to keep in order to make it eternal. The family is central to the plan, which is why when President Nelson was first, first became the president of the church at the press conference to announce his presidency, and reveal who his counselors would be. They met in the foyer of the Salt Lake Temple, and they were basically announcing everything we're going to do as a presidency, everything this church does, is pointing us to the temple to build eternal families. So many of the brethren have commented that the church is like scaffolding. Everything we do in the church is like scaffolding to build the real building we're here to build. The church is simply a temporary building, and everything we do is scaffolding that builds the eternal building, which is the eternal family. It is the only thing I will not be released from eventually. Russell M. Nelson will eventually not be the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And sadly, someday I will be released as the primary chorister in my ward, which is the best calling ever. I will be, I, I've been released from every calling that I've had. I've been released or will be released from everything else except one thing, family. It is the most important unit in time or in eternity. And therefore the building of an eternal family is the most important subject we can talk about. So today we're going to focus on Adam and Eve as a marriage, as a family coming together and learning how to live together and make their marriage last for eternity. Now, I recognize that for many of you, this is a painful subject because your current situation is not what you would choose. I am so sorry that you're having to deal with that. Those are challenges, but I believe in the ideal and I believe we should talk about the ideal because I believe someday Heavenly Father will make it possible for you. I believe we can fix broken families, but I also believe that if an opportunity has passed, another one will be presented. I don't know when, but I truly believe that no one runs out of time to receive a blessing they desire, not with a God that is beyond time. No one runs out of time. If you desire an eternal companion, it is my testimony that somewhere in your progression that will be provided. If you want an eternal companion, you will have one someday, somewhere, somehow, and I trust him to make that possible. So let's talk about the skill set that we're all going to need if we desire to enter the highest degree of the celestial kingdom and create an eternal family unit that will never end. 
What is the skill set? So let me introduce today's symbol, one of my absolute favorites. I would dare say that of all the, of all the symbols presented in the temple, I have probably spent more time talking and thinking and teaching about this symbol than any other symbol in the temple. I think it is such an important catch to see the simple symbol that is profound in its lesson. Today, we're going to talk about the rib. In a metaphorical moment, in a symbol, Heavenly Father takes a rib from Adam and creates Eve. Now, it is not our doctrine that that is literal. It is actually our doctrine that that is symbolic, that that is not how Adam and Eve were created. But that symbol is powerful in its lessons on how to make marriage work, how I need to treat my wife, because God placed Eve at Adam's side. Let's do three aspects of the symbolism of a rib that I think are instructive on how to make marriage work. Number one, my ribs primarily are at my side. And I think that's the idea that Adam took or that God took a rib from his side and that my wife is at my side. So there's number one is everything husband and wife do. They are to do side by side. Now, I recognize that in the church, we practice hierarchical priesthood. And hierarchical priesthood would say that people ordained to a certain office have a higher authority than people ordained to a lower office or people not ordained to an office. And I understand the great value in the church to practice hierarchical priesthood. But let's be clear. We do not practice hierarchical priesthood in the home. Priesthood in the home is very different and yet somewhat similar in some ways to priesthood in the church, but we do not practice hierarchical priesthood in the home. So the first thing we need to understand is that in the Lord's greatest unit, most important quorum of the two, that we stand side by side and that we don't practice hierarchical priesthood. We stand side by side. If God had taken Eve from Adam's foot, that would have placed her below him, that Adam was higher than Eve, but God did not symbolically take Eve from his foot. Now, unfortunately, we have all watched some men who place their wife below them, who step on them, tread on them. And that is not where the Lord intended a wife to be. He intended husbands and wives to always be side by side. If I do anything that places my wife below me, I am breaking that covenant that I have made with her. I am in violation of the covenant that God is trying to help me keep with the symbolism of the rib. Everything I do should place her at my side and not below me, not in front of me. God didn't take Eve from Adam's skull. That would have placed Eve above Adam. And Unfortunately, sometimes we see women that place themselves above their husbands or a man that doesn't want to take his rightful place at her side and just kind of bows out of the picture and lets her elevate. Eve was not above Adam. She didn't go in front. She didn't go behind. She wasn't above. She wasn't below. In all things, they walked side by side. When they leave the Garden of Eden, Adam doesn't hold her hand and lead her out. Eve doesn't lead Adam out. They leave the Garden side by side. And that is symbolic of how we are to navigate life. Everything I do 
needs to place my wife at my side. And everything that she does should place her husband at her side. How we raise the children, how we gather and spend finances, decision making, everything in the home as I see it in the symbolism. It must be a side-by-side decision. It must be a side-by-side act. Otherwise, I am placing my wife somewhere God did not intend her. Or my wife is placing her husband where God did not intend him. It is clear in the symbolism to me that Heavenly Father is instructing us to walk through life side by side. Allow me to invite a self-check moment. In your life, do you practice? If you're not married, then when you date, when you hang out with others, do you practice walking side by side with them? Is it your attitude that men and women walk side by side in life? Or do you practice an attitude of elevating one over the other? In your attitude, is one higher and more important than the other? If so, then I would suggest you are practicing something that is contrary to what the Lord intended us to live. And those of you who are married, I would invite you to ask this question. Am I doing things, either in open or in secret, or even in the dark chambers of my heart, Am I doing things that place my spouse below me, above me, ahead of me, or behind me? And I would invite you to hear the Lord's counsel that your spouse is at your side, side by side, in all that we do, in all the decisions that we make. I think we need to remember that beautiful symbolism and walk side by side. Number two, there are a couple ways in the symbolism to see this one. But let me ask, what is the purpose of a rib cage? Why do I have a rib cage? My ribs serve what purpose? They protect my vital organs. They protect my lungs and my heart. My ribs are a protective shield around my heart. And I like to see that also as kind of an under the wing symbolism, kind of like the hen that gathereth her chicks under her wing. My rib is under my wing. My ribs are a protective body, a protective entity that shields my heart. And if I can begin, I think I need to see myself as the protector of my wife's heart. I think by pulling Eve from Adam's rib, by placing husband and wife side by side, I hear the Lord giving me a commission and a directive that I am to protect her heart. When my wife and I married, she placed her very tender heart in my hands for safekeeping. I pledged on that day and pledge every day since that day to hold that tender heart safely, to protect it from harm, to be her rib cage. I pledge, pledged then and pledge today to protect her heart from harm. Now let's be honest. And I know My in-laws might be watching this video, so bear with me, but it's still true. No one loves that woman more than I do. I cherish her. But no one could hurt that woman more than I could. And I know it. Therefore, she has placed a sacred confidence in me, a sacred trust to be the rib cage that protects her heart. If I break that heart, 
I believe God will hold me uniquely accountable for that act. Allow me to quote from Elder Holland. On Valentine's Day, okay, technically the day after Valentine's Day because that's what Sunday was, but the day after Valentine's Day on the year 2000, Elder Holland stood up in front of a group of young single adults and declared the following. Now, this was in 2000, so let's add to the dates he gives to modernize it. He said, Life is a fragile thing, and some elements in life can try to break it. Much damage can be done if we are not in tender hands, caring hands. To give ourselves totally to another person as we do in marriage is the most trusting step we take in any human relationship. It is a real act of faith, faith all of us must be willing to exercise. If we do it right, we end up sharing everything, all our hopes, all our fears, all of our dreams, all of our weaknesses, and all of our joys with another person. No serious courtship or engagement or marriage is worth the name if we do not fully invest all that we have in it, and in so doing, trust ourselves totally to the one that we love. You cannot succeed in love if you keep one foot out on the bank for safety's sake. The very nature of the endeavor requires that you hold on to each other as tightly as you can and jump into the pool together. In that spirit, I want to impress upon you the vulnerability and the delicacy of your partner's future as it is placed in your hands for safekeeping. Male and female, it works both ways. Sister Holland and I have been married for nearly 37 years. Now again, that was in 2000, so we need to add 23 years, making that 60. He said back then, Sister Holland and I have been married for nearly 37 years. At that point, that was just a half, or a half dozen or so years short of twice as long as we lived without each other. I may not know everything about her, but I know 37 years worth, and she knows that much of me. I know her likes and dislikes, and she knows mine. I know her tastes and interests, and hopes and dreams, and she knows mine. As our love has grown and our relationship has matured, we have been increasingly free with each other about all of that. The result is I know much more clearly now how to help her. And if I let myself, I know exactly what will hurt her. In the honesty of our love, love that can't truly be Christ-like without such total devotion, surely God will hold me accountable for any pain I cause her by intentionally exploiting or hurting her when she has been so trusting of me. Having long since thrown away any self-protection in order that we could be, as the scriptures say, one flesh. To impair or impede her in any way for my gain or vanity or emotional mastery over her should disqualify me on the spot to be her husband. Indeed, it should consign my miserable soul to eternal incarceration in that large and spacious building, Lehi says, is the pride of those who live by vain imaginations and pride of the world. In all that Christ was, he was not ever envious or inflated, never consumed with his own needs, he did not once, not ever, seek his own advantage at the expense of someone else. He delighted in the happiness of others, the happiness he could bring them. Now that's that symbolism of that rib cage. I promised the day I married Jennifer that I would protect that heart, that her heart was in safe hands 
that I will do everything in my power to protect her. And if I ever damage her heart, I repent quickly. I must because I am the one she trusts to protect that vulnerable heart. And I think that is significant symbolism, what we promise in marriage. And it works both ways. My wife is the protector of my heart. No one could hurt her, hurt me more than she could, but she holds my heart tenderly in her hands. That's the beauty of the relationship and the marriage is that we protect each other. We are each other's rib cage to protect each other from harm. Like a hen gathereth her chicks, my wife and my children should feel safe in my presence. No woman should ever feel unsafe in the presence of the person she has trusted to protect her heart. Nor should any man feel unsafe that his wife is going to go gossip and share things that are intimate to them, that no, no, that no spouse is going to mock or make fun of or belittle or abuse or demean in any way. Like Elder Holland said, that should disqualify me to be their father and her husband if I'm going to do that. In rebuking the Nephite men who had violated laws of chastity, Jacob said something significant. He said that those who had done so had, quote, Ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites our brethren. Ye have broken the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children because of your bad examples before them. And the sobbings of their heart ascend up to God against you. And because of the strictness of the word which cometh down against you, many hearts died, pierced with deep wounds. That's what a broken rib could do to a heart, pierce it with a deep wound. I would invite all of us to examine our lives and how we have treated the significant others in our lives, whether you're married or not. Do you know how to protect hearts of the people that you love? As a teenager, were you able to protect the heart of your mother, your sisters, your brothers, your father? And those of us are married. I would invite us all to examine our lives. How am I doing at being the protector of my spouse's tender feelings? Do they feel safe in my arms, in my care, in my custody? Do my children shudder when I come home or do they grin? Allow me to share a quotation from W.C. Brand that has completely changed my life and moved me over the years a great deal. He said the following, the place to take the true measure of a man is not in the darkest place or in the amen corner nor the cornfield, but by his own fireside. There he lays aside his mask, and you may learn whether he is imp or angel, cur or king, hero or humbug. I care not what the world says of him, whether it crowns him boss or pelts him with bad eggs. I care not a copper what his reputation or religion may be. If his babies dread his homecoming and his better half swallows her heart every time she has to ask him for a $5 bill, he is a fraud of the first water, even though he prays night and morning until he is black in the face. But if his children rush to the front door to meet him and love's sunshine illuminates the face of his wife every time she hears his footfall, you can take it for granted that he is pure, for his home is a heaven. I can forgive much in that fellow mortal who would rather make men swear than women weep. 
who would rather have the hate of the whole world than the contempt of his wife, who would rather call anger to the eyes of a king than fear to the face of a child. I think all of that is written into that symbolism of the rib. Will you accept the responsibility to protect that heart every day? Your spouse is being very vulnerable. When you marry, your spouse is handing their heart to you for safekeeping. Pledge then, and if you have done so, pledge every day since then, that I will be a faithful guardian of that heart. I will be a true rib cage, and I will protect that heart from any harm. Number three, my rib is closest to my heart. I think the third message the Lord is sending me is don't you let anything closer to your heart than your spouse. Nothing and no one. Your spouse is closest to your heart than anyone or anything else. That seems to be the command. Keep her or keep him closest to your heart. Don't let anything or anyone in between that your spouse holds that preeminent space. Let me show you an interesting connection and you tell me how the Lord feels about loving your spouse. You remember when Jesus was asked, what was the great and the first commandment in the law? And he said, love the Lord thy God. And then he told us the level of love that was appropriate for God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. God we love with all our heart. Now, the second commandment was to love our fellow beings, love other people. But the level of love was not there. It was a lower level of love. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, that's a pretty high standard. If I thought of other people as often as I thought of myself, I'd, be, I'd love them at a very high level. If I was concerned about my spouse or my children as I am concerned about myself, if I thought of their hunger as often as I thought of mine, if I thought of their needs as often as I thought of mine, I would love them at a very high level. And that's appropriate for other human beings. Love God with all your heart and love everyone else as yourself. That was the command Jesus gave. Now, fast forward to the Latter-day Saints where the Lord has given us a new law. He sent us to Kirtland, Ohio to receive a new law. That law we call section 42 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Listen to one of the commandments given to us in the latter days, a modern day thou shalt, if you will. In Doctrine and Covenants section 42, verse 22, the Lord declared a new commandment in our day, which in essence takes one mortal, one other human, out of that love as yourself category and bumps them up to the love with all your heart category. And that is my spouse. Section 42.22, thou shalt love thy wife. And prophets have declared that it works both ways. Your husband, if you're the female. Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart and shall cleave unto her and none else. There's the command. First of all, pull her in closer to my heart than anyone else. There's only two people I have been commanded to love with all my heart. God and my spouse. Everyone else I keep at that other level. But God and my spouse, I love with all my heart and I cleave unto her and unto none else. President Kimball took that phrase and stated it this way. When the Lord says, all thy heart, it allows for no sharing, nor dividing, nor depriving. And to the woman it is paraphrased, thou shalt love thy husband with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto him and none else. The words none else 
eliminate everyone and everything. The spouse then becomes preeminent in the life of the husband or wife, and neither social life, nor occupational life, nor political life, nor any other interest, nor person, nor thing shall ever take precedence over the companion's spouse. The Lord says, Thou shalt cleave unto him and none else. Marriage presupposes total allegiance and total fidelity. Each spouse takes the partner with the understanding that he or she gives totally to the spouse all the heart, strength, loyalty, honor, and affection with all dignity. Any divergence is sin. Any sharing of the heart is transgression. She and only she and God are at that level. Only she has that much access to my heart. So there is some powerful symbolism I leave you to ponder. The symbolism of the rib. Do I keep my spouse, or if in the case of an unmarried person, will I keep my spouse at my side? Am I practicing that where it's appropriate today? Do I protect my spouse's heart like a rib cage is supposed to? Or am I the one causing the pain? Am I the broken rib that punctures that heart? And number three, does my spouse live closest to my heart? Or do I allow something or someone to take that place? May we learn from the symbolism of the rib how to make marriage better, how to make it work. Whatever is happening today, someday, if we desire to go to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, we must get this right. We must treat spouse the way Heavenly Father treats Heavenly Mother. May that be our goal. May we achieve eternal families. Because if we don't, if we can't make eternal families, I testify that this whole earth was a waste. May we live up to the symbolism we see every time we go to the temple and keep spouse like our rib. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.